right, so recording now. So I'm here with uh, Sarah Sh- Schlafly. 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 Yeah. Uh, she is the founder of Mighty Cricket. And um, on their website, it says that they have a vision to build a clean and equitable protein supply to sustain the world. Um, would you like to do just like a further intro, t- talk about yourself and your company? Yeah, sure. So my vision started, um, well, the story started quite a while ago. Um, when I was little, I heard this story about how my grandparents owned a bakery and during the Great Depression, they were able to feed themselves and their hungry neighbors with the bakery leftovers. And so I, this was kind of my family heritage, right? Is feeding other pe- people. And when I was little, climate change, then called global warming, was a very hot topic, widely debated in the 2000 pre- presidential election. I was only 10 years old at that point. And I was pretty scared about what the predictions were for the climate within my lifetime. And through um, through my, as a teenager and with each progressing year, I started seeing these predictions play out. Um, the worsening storms, the weather turning very warm here in St. Louis. Um, and then we get like a random blizzard. And I saw how this actually is impacting our food system. Um, just a couple of years ago, <clears throat> farmers had a 30% loss in crop in northern regions of like Canada because of the warm weather. So I wanted to build a resilient food supply for my community, just like my parents, my grandparents did during the Great Depression. And so I started looking for sources that were going to provide that resiliency. And it seemed like um, bugs are a solution for um, certain nutrients that are really hard to do in an urban setting. So um, proteins, you know, protein production historically has required a lot of land. And then there are some key nutrients that you can't get in in, um, plant protein, such as um, vitamin B12 or readily bioavailable nutrients such as omega-3 fatty acids and DHA form and EPA form. So bugs were kind of an interesting solution to that. And I started investigating and became pretty excited about the potential that they had for the future. Very skeptical, though, about Americans actually incorporating them into their diet. I didn't think we were there yet. Um, but I started talking about the concept and um, even coming up with some recipes and sampling around. And I real I noticed a few things. Um, in certain pockets of the population, it wasn't that hard of a sell. And also, it was a very naturally memorable and viral product. So people remembered that experience for months and even shared it with their friends. Um, so... With my food marketing background, I thought, wow, this is this product has inherent qualities that I would love to have in any product that I was marketing. And maybe there's a way that I can actually scale this company with those properties. Right, very cool. Yeah, it's a cool background story with the, uh, the bakery and everything. Um, so getting into sort of the particulars of the business, um, could you just like at a high level tell us um, like – what sort of insects you raise, uh, what products they, cert- they, they currently go into. Um, and also, do you raise the insects yourself? Um, or, you know, is that a, a thing you source? Or Yeah, right into- now I'm, I'm sourcing, I'm working directly with cricket farmers who've been doing it for a fairly long time. Um, the products I've worked with have all leaned on cricket and just getting cricket to be a more widely adapted source in the U.S. Um, And the reason why I chose cricket was because it seemed like the friendliest of all the bugs. And even at the time when I started working on this project, I didn't really want to eat a bug. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I was most willing to eat a cricket over Mm -hmm. any other bug. And I think that we just have a cultural warmth towards crickets because of Jiminy Cricket or um, 
Yeah, probably be just because of Jiminy Cricket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we kind of think of crickets as a little bit more friendly than, say, a mealworm, which sounds really scary and gross. Who wants to eat a worm in yeah. the U.S.? Have you? But considered- it turns out they're quite delicious. Yeah. Have you ever considered moving into any of those? Like, I know the mealworm and probably the black soldier fly are the two most other popular ones. Have you considered doing something with those? Well, because we operate in the human food space, um, I don't really see that being um, a viable path right now to gain very much market share. It takes an adventurous person to eat a cricket, but it takes, like, in the consumer's mind, eating a mealworm is just a step beyond. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so given that you know you, you do your sourcing for the uh, for the crickets, like you're not raising them yourself. I, I don't know if you'd have any insight into this. Um, although I, I'd imagine. Um, I want to discuss the the feed that's actually going into the crickets. Um, so in my research, I came across uh, you know I read the FAO publications. Uh, specifically the, the initial one, uh, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. Uh, and they discussed that uh, if the insects are to be eaten whole, um, they need to be fed basically human-grade food unless they are gutted. Um, so basically, can you shed any light on this? Like, is this the case? Um, are your insects gutted or are they you know, eaten whole or powderized? And if so, what is the implication on like the, the food that you have to give them? Hmm. So we powder our crickets and we sterilize them with um, heat, right, to kill off any pathogens that could arise just like, um, you know, cooking chicken or pork or beef. Um, the They are gutted in the sense that um, for the last couple days – before they're harvested, they're fasted. Um, so they're given like a water only diet. And then um, the last 24 hours, they're just fasting. So that helps out, cle- that clears out, you know, the digestive tracts. Um, so the most tinkering I've done with feed is related to uh, their, their taste. And their nu- nutrient content versus uh, safety, and I would say that the challenging part about feed is that you have to have very very clean feed, making sure that they aren't they don't have pesticides in it. Mm-hmm. So I did have a farmer who was trying to do things you know super as sustainable as possible, and he would scoop up grass clippings from his neighbor's farms and feed that to them. But one of them had pesticides in it and he killed his entire farm oh, no. from the feed. So that's the risk of um, utilizing waste, pre-consumer waste. Um, right. But I think there are ways to mitigate that whis- risk by um, – just through the collection process being very stringent and testing everything before you you incorporate it yeah. into the cricket's diet and understanding with your suppliers that um, <laughs> under, making sure that if the suppliers change anything that you're aware of that. Uh, so, and it can be tricky, especially when you're working with um, small scale farms that are, you know, constantly tinkering with their, with the way that they're practicing. Yeah. So, so I guess, do you know of any farms right now that are, they're taking things like human food waste um, and then using that to grow a human edible insect? Um, I guess, I guess is my question because the things I've read seem to suggest that um, people like the UN and people who are making regulations on these things think that there's a, a an undue risk with, certain pathogens and things like that um, mm-hmm. if you try to use human human food waste. So is that, is yeah, that so correct? You, the best thing, the, the safest thing is to use pre-consumer waste. Um, and so that would be waste coming from factories, waste coming even in restaurants. 
pre-consumer restaurant waste before it actually hit the consumer plates. Typically, once food hits the plates of the consumers, um, not really any farmer takes that and incorporates it into their livestock. Okay. Um, whether it's pigs or cows or chicken. Oh, well, chickens actually. Never mind. I, I believe um, chickens and pigs do get slop, which would be post consumer waste. Yeah, I've seen. I know the famous instance in uh, Vegas from all the uh, the buffets, which I think includes stuff that actually came from people's plates. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Now that I'm thinking about that, I think uh, that statement is inaccurate. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm. I'm not as familiar with you know if any of the farms are taking post-consumer waste okay yeah yeah i don't expect you to be you know if it's not like you know your area and this is is the um yeah the, the business side of it so like i totally get that um uh i wanted to ask so th this is kind of a corollary on the the food thing um and it's Again, totally fine if you don't have like immediate familiarity with this off the top of your head. It's a little esoteric, but um, I've been looking into some research uh, about the the protein conversion efficiencies of you know crickets as compared to other animals. Mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly one by a team Lundy and Perel in 2015 that was looking at crickets. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, basically the the gist of the study was they tried to measure how how efficiently protein could be taken from feed and turned into animal protein you know, actually incorporated into the animal's body um and for the lundy and perel study for instance it came within uh they compared chickens and crickets for instance and it ended up being uh nearly identical uh food conversion efficiencies so to produce a similar amount of protein they ate about the same amount of food so, uh, and similar, similar things have been found. For instance, there's a study by Dennis, uh, Uninsix, which I, I think he's, uh, Dutch out of, out of Wanganengen. So Uninsix and Boar, <clears throat> and they did a similar life cycle analysis on mealworms, uh, to again, find a similar food conversion efficiency, uh, as compared to that of chickens, um. Would you have any comments on, on these analyses or, again, if you don't have immediate familiarity with them, I don't expect you to like have to comment on them. But th this was like a big sticking point um, in, in the research I've done. Hmm. Um, so do, do, do you know anything about these or would you have any comment about them? Um, well, I know the um, FCRs for chickens are pretty good. And also, like, the whole animal is pretty much used. We think of, you know, only for whether it's chickens or cows or beef, they find a way to use, have a use for like 98% of the animal. So there's very mm -hmm. little waste mm -hmm. um, going on at the slaughterhouse. Um, so I think that maybe the feed conversion ratio, it probably is similar to chicken. Um, that's just one piece of the pie. You know, you also have to think about quality of the animal's life and um, the ethics, I guess that also plays a role in quality of life. Like, you know, the chickens, uh, it's hard to know what the practices are. Yeah, um, it can be you, pretty bad in there, I'm, I'm sure. I really struggle with the terminology because I know that free range is different than um, cage free. And I always forget like which one is kind of a marketing term and which one's actually legit. Or are they both marketing terms? Like, yeah, it's really like hard that. to know. And then at the slaughterhouses, like, how are those chickens being handled? So what I like about cricket is that, um, I mean, crickets themselves are pretty robotic. Um, yeah, I'm no sure way. that they have feelings to some extent, but like, 
bugs don't feel pain in the way that mammalians do. I like that. But I also like the harvesting process is just the crickets going into hibernation <laughs> and eventually yeah. perishing. It's like the it's the best you could get <laughs> from <laughs> that you could hope for for any um, living being dying is um, just dying in their sleep, which right. is really cool. Yeah, it, it's so. certainly um, <clears throat> to make clear and for people watching this, I'm not. I'm not at all wanting to defend the current agricultural production system. And in fact, I think there's a lot of issues, which is why I wanted to look into this in the first place. Um, yeah. Because you know, it's been talked about as a solution to some of these problems. Yeah. I do believe um, CO2 emissions are, f there's um, fewer in cricket than chicken. I don't know. Have you yeah. done any research on that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of a wrinkle in that uh, directly from the animal themselves, um, it, it does produce less. And it's a pretty significant amount, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, like, but, you know, like 30 percent, not like 2 percent or whatever. Um, it is offset a little bit by the fact that I believe insects have to be, uh, you know, they're, they're cold blooded. So they have to live in like a climate controlled area or mm -hmm. a barn that's much more strictly climate controlled as compared to chickens who they, they yeah. can deal with some temperature fluctuations. So that can um, influence the, the overall like, uh, carbon footprint. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I know some farms that have incorporated a lot of solar for yeah, that yeah. reason. And or they move the to, they farm in like um, Thailand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing is it's like it can, it can be offset with like uh, renewables and stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, Again, I'm not sure if this is something you would you would know about if you, you deal with, but um, it's a question I, I never really was able to find an answer to is when farming insects, are there any concerns about containment? Um, you know, for instance, like I think I calculated it's like 363,000 crickets to have as much protein as you get from a cow. Um, but if one cow gets out, obviously it's not that big a deal to go get it. Uh, but what would happen, you know? If you have, you know, the Akeda domesticus and, um, you know, it got out into an area that it wasn't native to, um, is this something that people in the industry are aware of and they have like things to, you know, help alleviate if that happens or prevent it in the first place? Yeah, that would be a problem. Um, fortunately, Akeda domesticus is almost has a presence across the whole world. So it's definitely in North America. It's definitely in Asia. Um, I don't know if it's in all of Asia, but in most of Asia. Um, in Africa, too. Like, it's, it's a very common bug. I wouldn't recommend farming a bug if it wasn't already um, in that region. I think that could yield some destruction so as a result um farmers do make sure that most like most farmers make sure that the bugs that they're farming are already in that area because okay. i don't think you would be able to contain 100 percent of right. the bugs right. okay yeah that's a good answer i mean i feel like there's so many different little questions that people haven't considered about this uh this topic so it's good to just you know talk about them squash them um <laughs> uh so uh next question and, and i don't think this, this is the case specific specifically for crickets um but do your bugs or do you think that there are bugs just in general that have the potential to break down um you know crop residues what farmers call them but basically mm. like, like straw and whatnot um and you know it doesn't have to be the cricket because i'm not I'm fairly certain that they, they can't live off that, but maybe other uh, bugs can. Yeah, I mean, I think the the straw would be more of like a fiber supplement to their diet, but they yeah. need a little bit more nutrition than just straw. Um, termites, I think, could – I mean, termites will eat just – they'll live on cardboard. Yeah, and they're – So that's pretty cool. They're edible. Like they – I, I, at least I've seen like apes eating them, right? So they. <laughs> yeah. Why would you farm termites? That's that's the question. Um, <laughs> yeah. I they're rich in oil, so termites could be extracted for, um, like an industrial oil. 
and that we've also looked into doing, but right now um, we have our hands full with the crickets. And also we would want to farm termites kind of in a, a rural area right. and figure yeah. out like and if they do barn. escape, they don't wreck havoc on, yeah. you know, neighbor's properties. Cause that would be an issue. Yeah. All right. Um, do you know anything about, uh, cause this is a big environmental point about insect farming as compared to conventional animals. Um, do you know anything about their water consumption and, uh, you know, like on the farms you source from like particularly, uh, I, and like this, this might be like really deep knowledge for you to need to have. But um, do you, do you know also like if some of that water is blue versus green water? You know, like rainwater hmm. versus I, if you I don't know if you're familiar with those terms. Um, I'm surprised I'm not familiar. I I know of gray water. Yeah, so um, it, it's I I don't know why they call them this, but it's it's the distinction between like rainwater is considered green water like it's not um it's renewable oh, okay. and then blue water would be things like water pumped from aquifers that's you know that's been there for tens of thousands of years and it doesn't come back quickly um so there's a concern with like depleting aquifers and things like that gotcha um, um... I don't know if the farmers are correct collecting rainwater, but I imagine um, most of a good number of them in Thailand are Thailand and Vietnam, just because when I've traveled there, that's um, that's a very common practice. Okay, is collecting rainwater. Yeah. It's probably um, cheaper too. Like yeah. Sense. Also in Central America, when I was traveling there, I saw a lot of rainwater co collection. Um, I'm not sure about the U.S. farms, if they're what they're doing for the water. I do believe, based on my research, that the water consumption is much less. Yeah. Um, than you know, yes. animals that yeah. are larger. <laughs> mm. Certainly a lot less than cattle. Um, and yeah. Pigs. It, it chicken closes in on it, but I, I believe insects still do, you know, consume less. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think th this is probably something, you know, a lot more about. Um, I want to just ask about the nutritional value of insects. Um, I just know practically nothing about the nutrition. So, you know, could you just give me and whoever's listening just like a little rundown of, you know, what sort of uh, what basically vitamins are they good for what proteins are they good for um and do you think there's any uh, downsides to consuming insects like you know it may be if we started eating like a majority of our protein from insects say um do you know of any like knock-on effects that have been documented or uh mm. just anything you know about like nutrition at a high level yeah levels? yeah this is um kind of what i've researched the most um so Crickets are a complete protein, which is nice because you get all your essential amino acids from muscle synthesis. Um, they, but you know, Americans don't really have a protein problem. <laughs> we eat a lot of protein. Um, but it would be, I think it would be smart still to keep trying to replace our beef. Now, there's been a, there was a big spike in um, the plant based protein, pat beef patties and that has had a major hit in the past year or two um i think it's because well it was novel everyone was trying it but and that novelty faded but also like people didn't not as many people incorporated into the regular diet as um, was ex hoped and expected by the companies, probably just because of the health, you know, like they're making it mimic beef. So it's going to be inherently less healthy. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that's one factor. Um, but with cricket, you, you get a really clean form of protein because you, you're not having the, um, estrogen spike at the harvesting process which pretty much all of our cows are getting unless you're getting like a cow from a farm that lived a happy life and had a happy death 
Yeah, um, wow. Same with chicken. Chickens, you know, chickens don't get growth hormones for, um, yeah, they don't get growth hormones. That's actually illegal to give chickens growth hormones. But they were bred to have really large breasts. And then those breasts um, actually make them disproportionate and off kilter. And yeah. so that's how um, chickens have larger breasts than, yeah. than they used to. And so their their quality of life is kind of stressed out, especially being in the chicken coop. So that stress is being put into the meat that we are then consuming. So from a very clean protein standpoint, I do like cricket for that reason. Um, they also have chitin. So chitin is kind of a double-edged sword. There's been a study that shows that chitin, which is a fiber. Um, it's like they're... Uh, it's made makes up their exoskeletons correct yeah 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 so chitin can be really good for as a prebiotic which promotes the growth of healthy gut bacteria um for some people they're allergic to chitin because they have you know that allergen it's the same allergen that makes them allergic to shellfish um so for those people it pretty much rules out all bugs. I think m most bugs have an exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not a good choice for people with chitin allergens. Right. Um, so it can be it can be an inflammatory response for some people. Um, and then the vitamin B12 is fairly high in cricket. Um, depending on what you feed it, you can get a serving to be up to 100% of your vitamin B12, which is huge because you can't get that on plants. No, that's very tough. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to take a supplement, which is fine. I mean, supplements are a good solution too. But if mm. you don't want to take a supplement, you know, you can use this as a supplement too. Um, and then there are a couple of nutrients that are just in a more bioavailable form. So omega-3 fatty acids, you have three different kinds. You have ALA, EPA, and DHA. Um, ALA is only found in plants. Or I should say plants only contain ALA. I don't, oh, okay. I don't know if animal – I don't think any animals have ALA. But that's the form – that plants contain. And you have to eat nine times the amount of ALA omega-3s to get this, to absorb the same amount as you would in the other two forms that are found in animals. Right. So because cricket is an animal in, in the animal kingdom and not in the plant kingdom, it just means that our bodies as animals can make use of their nutrients a little bit easier than consuming those nutrients in plants. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I'm glad you mentioned the chitin. Um, there's, I'm sure you're aware, there's a lot of people online who uh, I think they're a little bit uh, unhinged, but like they, they claim chitin is like this horrible, uh, like indigestible thing that's going to wreak all this havoc, which I've never seen backed <laughs> up with any, any studies. Like I, I know there's the allergen thing with, with shellfish, but um, you know, if you go, obviously people get very emotional about their food, which, you know, they feel yeah. a connection to it. So it makes sense. Yeah. But um, yeah, if if you look for people who are uh, against humans eating bugs, like th this is the one thing that always comes up. Um, but they never seem to cite their source. They never seem to like say why this is the case. They're just like, it's horrible. You're gonna die. Um, which I, yeah, I've never that's seen substantiated. That's interesting. I've seen a few food trends that were founded by a person who had an actual allergen to that food. And is becomes very passionate and thinks like, because I have an allergen, it can't be good for the rest of people. But right. all of our bodies are just like slightly different. And something that's good for me may kill you. <laughs> like peanuts for me cause me no problems, but you might die if you have peanuts. And like that extremity really is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I've read there's been like some chitin pushback and I've even had, <laughs> um, 
like a few people one time called me from some sort of seminar that they were at and they were like telling me how terrible Kaiden was, yeah. but they called it Chitin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did I'm too like, before I heard someone say it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like if you're, if you're actually like at a scientific event, right they yeah. wouldn't be saying chitin <laughs> yeah that that whole thing's suspect I, I don't think anyone needs to worry about that in particular that's <laughs> weird red herring um all right cool um i wanted to ask because this is just kind of my own uh you know it, this seems to make sense to me basically but i want to see if you could validate it um economics wise it seems like you could make you could produce like an equivalent amount of insect protein for like way way cheaper as compared to any other source of animal protein um and i i would think it comes down to land cost because they just inherently take less land um and labor cost is i think would be a big one because you know i've seen these uh these people who ideally they want to get to a a situation where they're growing in like a 12-story building and it's all uh, managed by robots and everything yeah you know uh would would this be the case and like just in your own experience do you see that like the cost of production uh, is is currently lower or if not do you think that it could be lower in the future and like yeah it's definitely not lower but it's mind-blowing that it's not because (laughs) it does require fewer inputs um so you would think that it would cost a lot less but what we're going up against is decades of subsidies in the um cattle industries and the yeah the traditional farming and decades of innovation there and there wasn't you know for thousands of years crickets were being farmed in thailand it's kind of the epicenter of the cricket industry historically and there wasn't a lot of you know there hasn't been innovation on those farms in terms of automation and cutting out the labor because labor is cheap there. And it just, it's a harder financial case. And they also don't have a culture of, you know, the same level of innovation that we have here in the U S. So there hasn't been enough investment in the space to really reduce the cost. And that's, that's what needs to happen. And the cost will eventually be lower than um in the traditional livestock industries just if the investments continue to happen and if we keep continue to working towards this and cricket farmers need subsidies too (laughs) there's so so much subsidizing going on in um beef and pork and right and even the corn culture. alone is you know that's yeah. gonna be a huge part of it how much of that is subsidized yeah um yeah so yeah i think it's a good answer um so i'm curious to uh to hear what you have to say you know so the entire a lot of the argument around insects has to do with the reduced environmental impact um i think in this regard vegans would have a pretty strong argument against you so you know so what would you say you know, because the vegan obviously would argue, why don't we just skip the bugs altogether and just try to get everyone on a plant based diet? You know, what, what would you say to that person? I actually have some vegans who consume our products. Um, I guess they're not vegan anymore, but no. they went vegan um, for health purposes or like animal cruelty purposes, mm-hmm. but um, they just had a hard time on the vegan diet. For whatever reason, their bodies just needed something that they weren't getting and they were they were struggling to get it. So then they switched back to eating, consuming animal products. Um, so I don't think that um, the vegan diet might not work for everyone. I don't know. Maybe like if they incorporated another food into their diet all of their symptoms would go away um it's hard to know but i would say with um the vegan diet it doesn't necessarily mean you're eating sustainable (laughs) um so i love almonds and if i were vegan i would eat a ton of almonds but almonds require so much water Mm. and 
there are some plants that are just like really high in require a lot of resources. And so, um, you know, and also, okay, so almonds are grown in Southern California where there's been massive droughts. And farmers are trying, the government's trying to convince farmers to not plant more almond trees, but there's such high demand for it mm -hmm. that more, you know, the almond production continues to grow and the water continues to shrink. Palm oil, that's plant-based, highly destructive to the Amazon for rainforest. Yeah. And that is a vital organ to our whole ecosystem. I mean, we can't let the Amazon continue to shrink and expect a healthy climate. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think about I think about those things when I'm eating and just it's hard to like know what is greenwashing and what's more sustainable. And when you really dig into it, it's kind of discouraging because it feels like whatever you do, you're just causing destruction everywhere. Um, but then the last thing is with, with plant proteins, you typically need a lot of land for like soy, um, pea, you know, it requires – a good deal of space and arable soil too. And the earth has lost a third of its arable soil in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. One third. That is mind blowing. In um, the Netherlands, I believe, they're completely tapped out of their land. So farmers are starting to have to go indoors. Um, and you can grow plants indoors, but, you know, plants – Soy beans indoors. Um, I'd be interested to see what kind of space requirements soybeans need indoors um, versus crickets. I think that would be a very interesting study, but I don't know what the answer is to that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I the vegan thing's tough because with it being an environmental thing, they just they seem to have like obviously theirs would be the lowest impact, but is it actually possible for everyone to do that? You know. I tried Another... veganism for a bit, and it. Uh, I really tried, but it just, really, you know, it, yeah. I mean, like quality foods, everything. It just was not doable for me at all. Mm. I felt horrible. Well, we also vegans are eating a whole lot of bugs in their diet. Everyone eats just in regular supermarket food about three hundred and eighty-five bug bits every day. Wow! So there's that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then like. Man, there's so many animal products we use that we don't realize come from animals. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I was looking at the number of things you make from a cow, you know, like like sutures in surgery. Yeah, cow tendons. It, it's it's wild. Yeah, things, but uh, it's really crazy. And then lastly, like, you know, I kind of I treat I found really out there with this philosophy, but. I don't know. It's just kind of grown. I've grown into it. I treat all living things as a living thing, whether it's a plant or an animal. Mm -hmm. And I no longer just like go around. If, if I see a plant dying in my house, I actually feel really guilty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good and response. It's yeah. like life that I've killed. And um, I view all my plant things that I'm consuming is life. You know, it's, it's alive actually yeah. as you're consuming it. If yeah. it's a fresh leaf or an apple that hasn't rotted yet, those cells are still alive. Yeah. And like, what's the difference between, I've, I've always been curious on like, why don't vegans eat things like oysters, you know, if they don't even have a brain, but anyways, um, I'm definitely not against the vegan diet, by the way. I, I yeah. think it's great if people want to eat vegan. Yeah, yeah. I wish I could. I wish I could do it. <laughs> I just, you know, God bless them, whatever. Um, so let's see. Um, I, I just got two questions left. One is, um, so what would you say to people? Like we kind of touched on it a little bit, but, you know, people who for reasons other than just they don't want to eat insects. Um, they, they, maybe they have a valid reason. Like, uh, like we talked about allergies, you know, those people aren't really going to be able to eat insects. 
Um, I think there's some cases where like religious exemptions come into place. Like um, I think kosher law for Jews is like uncertain on eating bugs, right? So I, I think they might have like an exception to it. Like, um, I guess what would you say to these people? And then how does that fit into like the larger picture? Like, do you see everyone eating bugs uh, for maybe just a part of their protein or like a, a majority or, you know, how, how do you see mm. the future of eating it? And like, how do you make these exceptions for people? In the future, I see, so for a good while, for the next maybe 15 years, yeah, our, our, our culture and society is changing so fast. If you think about where we were at 15 years ago, it's crazy to think about. But food, technology changes pretty quickly. Food is, our trends take a little a little bit slower time to evolve. So in the, in the next 15 years, I see bugs as mostly kind of a fortified powder, kind of like a whey protein or um, a powdered pea protein. And it, I see brands starting to fortify cereals with um, this type of protein just for the people who have allergens to gluten and whey and soy. And in my household, <laughs> we are allergic to gluten soy dairy quinoa um and recently my husband has been got bitten by the tick that makes you allergic to mammalian meat oh yeah so there's this new allergen alpha gall is what it's called and he can only eat poultry bugs and seafood wow <laughs> and plants that's really bad yeah sorry yeah, so alpha gall is like definitely um, making waves in our food trends as more and more people get it. Um, so I see, I see products being fortified with it. I don't see, and I see restaurants incorporating like whole bugs more into their menus. Um, and then beyond that, I think it would start trickling into the retail shelves as perhaps whole bugs um, in a more mainstream way. But I think, yeah, I think that's beyond 15 years. Okay. Did you ever see us reaching a point where, you know, in the West people get, let's say, just like a, a healthy portion of their protein, you know, 10, 15, 20% from insects? Or do you think yeah, I, th I think that's that's going to be achieved just because of the awareness that future generations have on the climate and and um, it also depends on where um, the lab based meats go. Like if it reaches right. a point where lab based meats are a viable option, just from a financial standpoint. Right. Okay. Um... And just, you know, lastly, and you can add in any sort of your final thoughts on this question. Um, do you have any other changes that, you know, you we would you like to see in our food system in the next, you know, decade or two? Um, you know, I, I, th I see things like food uh, waste upcycling in the term yeah. uh, for insects is obviously a step in the right direction. But, you know, do you see any other things that are maybe just obvious changes, the large impact changes that we should make? I would like to see... Um... A closer, um, what's what's the word for it? I would like to see our food coming from closer sources. You know, we're used to our food being exported around the world. And as a food brand, you know, that's <laughs> what one would hope is their brand is all over the world. But in doing so, I hope that... Um, I'd like to see the food actually being produced locally at a local level. I think that could be really great. Um, it's that's hard because it's not as convenient for people right. um, to have local food, which is interesting. But when your food is packaged and shipped around the world, it's in a convenient form, packaged, you know, right. preserved. So people tend to go that way. Um, so are, are you, I also, 
Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. I, I was going to say, are you then, it sounds like, would you be in favor of like the, you know, pasture raised local beef sort of movement? Is, is that something that you're like warm to that idea or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that could be great. Um, I do. I did read some studies about the importance of ruminants. Right. Have you read about that? Yeah. Like, so they can do a lot to help the the health of a, a grasslands. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the natural so like state cows. of the Midwest of the U.S. is is grasslands, and it needs, uh, for instance, like buffalo used to be there. But if you put cows there, they do the same thing. They're ruminants as well, um, and you know their manure and like the way they. Uh, basically maintain the grass. It, it's really good, and it makes this whole ecosystem in in the soil of mm -hmm. bacteria and everything that really helps it out. But um, so yeah, yeah and the problem evolves when you get cows all confined in small spaces. And right, that's really yeah. you know the issue. But it takes a lot of resources to have pasture raised cows that are actually good for the environment, and like. Man, that cow would cost way more than it does now in their cow confines. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that, you know, a truly healthy animal meat from a cow is going to be financial, is going to be affordable to most Americans. Um, right. And so that's where. Like my goal is to make a protein, a very clean protein that people in at any income level could afford. Um, it's not there yet because <laughs> we don't have the innovation yet, but that's what we're right. working towards. Yeah. yeah, very cool. But another thing I want to say about that is um, there's been this <laughs> backlash from people thinking that bugs are being pushed down to us by the elites because yes, a few yeah a few celebrities made a video made some videos about like eating bugs and they showed themselves doing it and was basically saying you should too and now people think there's this conspiracy theory that um Rit, like super wealthy people are trying to get everyone else to eat bugs so that they can eat their beef. <laughs> yeah. And I don't, I don't really know if there's, I, I haven't seen that actually all the bug players in the industry that are, that I'm friends with. Um, I'm pretty much friends with all the players in the industry. Yeah. They're all super scrappy like me, like not a lead at all, barely getting any funding. It's just like some, you know, super future thinking people who want to help out the climate and help out people getting access to clean protein. And so then maybe some like celebs jumped in to help out and try and like use their influence to spread the movement. Right. But yeah, there's been like, it really backfired. <laughs> yeah. Celebrity endorsements are definitely a double-edged sword. Yeah, I think that Americans are just very wary of like the ultra elite celebs that are endorsing products that they don't actually believe in. There's this disillusionment with it. That used to work like in the 60s or so, I think, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, agreed. We're definitely much more skeptical these days. Yeah. You know, when they're flying on private jets, it's like, well, how many bugs do you have to eat to offset that? You know, it's right, right. Yeah. It's a little bit, yeah. It can, it can look a little bit inauthentic. Yeah, totally. And that's, you know, and then, then you almost can't blame the conspiracy theorists. Like, they get, I mean, if they if they just see that, but you know, th that's kind of the intention of what what I'm trying to do here is like just have a rational discussion about like what this movement really is what uh what does the science say about it what do the people who are in the industry say about it so yeah um, yeah i mean with that do you have anything else you'd like to say you know open open air whatever you'd like oh uh, i do want to say what the celebrities need to do is they need to 
do what like Tesla did. Only the rich people can eat bugs because this is the best form of protein. It's only affordable. It's a, it's kind of expensive right now. Only the rich can afford it. Mm -hmm. You can't have it. And then everyone else will want it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I did notice like on Amazon, um, some bag of protein from Entomo was, was like much more expensive than I thought it would be, you know, the cricket yeah. flower. But um, I'm sure it's just a question of economics. You know, it'll come down as uh, as time goes on, as things get more efficient. You know, people maybe don't realize like how hyper efficient things like chicken production are today. Like we've had, I don't know how many thousands of years to, you know, raise chickens and get get familiar with them and uh, and all that. So. So, yeah, um, that was that was all the questions I wanted to go through. Um, you've been super helpful. Thank you for taking the time. And um, yeah, I, I suppose that's it. Any final, final thoughts? Final, final thoughts. Um, you know, whether or not you eat bugs like intentionally you're eating them anyway unintentionally so it's not gonna kill you <laughs> but they're actually quite good mm -hmm. they're delicious and i think that's something that um i think that's where a lot of food brands a lot of bug food brands are missing the mark consumers don't actually care about sustainability a very small percentage of consumers actually care about sustainability. Yeah. All we care about is, is it convenient and does it taste good? And then some people are like, is it healthy for me? All right. The but sustainability piece, that's just a bonus. Like I don't see America having any major widespread food trend based on a sustainability argument. I see it as, oh, wow, this tastes good. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's fair that's, people care but they're maybe not enough to the point they'll actually spend more money as compared to the other option right issue. like if it tastes terrible i'm not gonna eat it even if it's sustainable right. yeah <laughs> that makes sense very good yeah very good thoughts to end it off with um so yeah thank you thank you so much again for taking the time to sit down with me um yeah and we'll like i said uh i'll just put this whole uh, interview up I think there's like a huge dearth of stuff like this online so this will really help people get an insight into like you know the people who are involved in this and uh, where it's kind of going so again yeah thank you very much and um, yeah I'll, uh, I'll let you know when <laughs> I'm still recording I'll stop recording now bye everyone okay <laughs>